You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Guten Tag. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 121. All right. I'm your host, Rish Outfield. And I'm your other host, Big Anklevich. That's right. It says on our business card, other hosts. Yeah. It's weird. That's that what mine says. Yours just says host. Yeah. Well, do you think that was a typo? Well, you had a maid. Probably not. I just don't like you as much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, for coming uh, out all this way. I know it was a long drive and the road has not been maintained well. We uh, bring you every once in a while a fiction story that you submit to us. This week's submitted story, boy, see, I, that would have been a good segue into how they submit, but we don't do that till after, do we? No. Sorry. Hey, uh, can you have the robot uh, edit all this stuff out and just make it sound like it's supposed to sound with the whole... Sure. I'll... Okay, so I'm starting again. This week's story is Enter Sandman by Jeff Carlson. Jeff Carlson is the author of the internationally acclaimed sci-fi thrillers Plague Year and Plague War in stores now. You can find free excerpts from both novels as well as an insanely cool book trailer at his website at www.jverse.com. That's J as in Jeff and verse as in universe. Jverse.com. Today's story was originally published in Artemis Magazine. Jeff's other short fiction credits include sales to Asimov's, Writers of the Future 23, and the upcoming Fast Forward 2 anthology from Pyre Books. Enter Sandman by Jeff Carlson. In the closing moments of the game, Smashball's greatest champion aimed for his opponent's head instead of a score zone. Jake Bolt led 4-3, to three, and rattling his challenger was easier and almost as good as extending his lead. It was also far more stylish. His fans loved it. No feints, no trick ricochets, just a hard Bolt special from one end of the box to the other. He took advantage of a weak volley, skipping the ball sideways off the nearest wall as he bounced himself off the ceiling and onto his upper platform. A spectacular move possible only in lunar gravity. Then he clubbed the ball downward. Yet clearly Bolt had made too much a habit of kill shots. His opponent was ready and brought up both hands, fingers spread wide, pale blue fire sparking from each gloved palm. The magnetized ball shot back at Bolt's lower platform, dead on the red score zone. Bolt dove, getting a pinky on it, but the ball still struck the zone's edge. However, no points registered on the board. Rewind the last two seconds and play it slow. Somehow that genius son of a bitch is cheating. Gerald Sandifer stood with his back to a plush smart chair that he couldn't seem to use for more than a few moments at a time. He was a small man, made smaller by the partial crouch that put his weight on the balls of his feet. He unconsciously shifted from side to side exactly as the black-suited figures in the tape had done before each serve, gliding slightly above the floor. Don't be stupid. Sandifer's trainer, Anne Ramey, placed both hands on her hips as he glanced back. Ramey had 17 centimeters and at least 10 kilos on him, and 16 years. He knew she regretted the latter statistic, but that she enjoyed having her breasts almost level with his face. There are hardly any rules, she said. How could a smasher possibly cheat? Sandifer ignored her pose. Just rewind it. Ramey sighed and fussed with the old digital projector. This thing's a pain in my ass. Let's feed the whole match into your NP and we can dissect it frame by frame, okay? No, nothing with a hard drive or net connected. Well then, hold your horses, my boy. The wall of Sandifer's place had not been intended for use as a projection screen and was dotted with adhesive buttons where he'd removed frame prints and proxy cards capturing the triumphs of old-time greats and his peers, including two shots from Jake Bolt's recent back-to-back Superbox wins. 
Sandifer's own trophies filled a closet upstairs and decorated the front hall of Ramey's communal apartment across town. They were watching an illegal bootleg, the left side of which was partially blocked by a woman's shaved head. Ramey had remarked more than once on that smooth, sexy scalp. Her jokes and comments had grown more frequent as her frustration increased, and Sandifer worried he might have to cut her loose. He didn't want that. Each time she said, Woo, love the close-up. Or, Scan that skin. Sandifer replied that whoever she hired to smuggle in the camera must be an overpaid pervert. In truth, he was pleased with the quality of the footage. A plastic microcam sewn into a shirt collar could hardly be expected to do better. And all the spectators' head concealed were the challenger's upper platform and midstep. Sandifer was far more interested in what Bolt was doing across the box. It was sheer paranoia to have burned the microcam chip after making a copy onto digital tape, rather than downloading the whole thing directly into his pricey NP widescreen. But Sandifer wanted no traces left when he was done. Smashers were allowed to study publicly available broadcasts all they wanted. But the image and likeness of every player was strictly licensed by the Lunar Smash Ball League. And while the LSL unofficially encouraged extravagant behavior short of unprovoked homicide in its players, all the better to increase the ratings and merchandise sales, bootlegging charges could get Sandifer suspended or even barred forever. He might have considered it too sweet to risk if he hadn't found himself so close to the absolute pinnacle. As the sixth seeded player in the LSL, Sandifer should have come up short of next week's finals, except the fourth seed disqualified herself by testing positive for heaven sent, and the fifth seed had broken several ribs when he charged his opponent's platforms and careened through the box in an uncontrolled fall that was still being replayed on the sports net. Numbers two and three would play each other, and Jake Bolt, top dog like always, had the privilege of facing the lowest-seeded finalist. Sandifer had never played Bolt before. He'd spent most of his brief career in the semi-pros. So when Ramey said she knew a guy who could get them actual video, Sandifer agreed to front the money. Because publicly sold broadcasts consisted of just two mediums, flat-screen videotapes and exo reel clips. The first were beautifully packaged, highly edited, useless. And exo reel clips were even worse. Wearing Bolt's body wasn't the same as watching him objectively, and an opponent's point of view was maddening since Sandifer couldn't control where to look. It was disorienting, too, to be constantly strobed by advertising and inundated with crowd noise, which was dubbed in. The game itself was played quietly. The constant drumming of the ball, the slap of repeller gloves. ER was too flashy to be a worthwhile study guide. And now his paranoia felt justified. He would have rather discovered that Jake Bolt was a child molester. Finally, Ramey muttered a happy curse at the projector. And they watched Bolt attempt his kill shot again. Hope he tries that on you! Ramey practically shouted. Look how he left himself open. He almost got scored on. I'm telling you, he was scored on. He deflected it by a hair, my boy. It's just a microcam at a bad angle. But the angle wasn't that bad. The man who'd worn the camera had sat second row, center box... Sandifer trusted his eyes and his instincts. He had to. Once upon a time, Ramey had played two seasons herself before a wicked knee injury. But the sensors that saturated the box, the ball, and the smasher suits had improved a great deal since then. Everyone had total faith in LSL technology. There were no longer any referees or line judges, never timeouts or instant replays. There didn't need to be. The score zones centered in the upper and lower platforms automatically registered contact with the ball, no matter how slight. Jake Bolt had not earned his latest win. You're crazy, Ramey insisted, and Sandifer imagined she was having a good time bickering. She obviously enjoyed leaning her head against his arm to sight down his finger. Lately, she'd been touching him more than usual during workouts, constantly correcting his posture with a rough hand or a poke. But the evidence became incontrovertible half an hour later, after an on-store courier arrived with a magnifying glass. Holy God! Ramey said. God! Her usual gruff booming had been reduced to a whisper, intense as the fear crawling through Sandifer's vertebrae. And they paced restlessly back and forth under the image of the golden ball, touching the red mat of the score zone. This pisses me off! 
Sandifer said, bouncing high on his toes. Doesn't this piss you off? Holy god damn! If they can block points that should have counted against him, I bet they can give him scores too if he slaps the ball in close enough. Proximity triggers or something. Sandifer stepped aside when Ramy reached for him as if seeking comfort. He said, How long do you think this has been going on? The LSL must know, Ramy babbled. I mean, they're the ones who control the scoring computers, right? We are holding a bomb here, my boy, a big bomb, and I don't think we want credit for it. Let's stay anonymous when we blow him out of the water. Sandifer smiled thinly. We're not going public. What? Then why spend all this time? We can use this in a much better way. The Lunar Smash Ball League made big, big money, as did everything extraterrestrial. In what had become a careful, civilized era devoid of adventure aside from remote guerrilla wars and the legal squabbling of global mergers, both political and corporate, there were Earth Leagues too, of course, but in comparison the action was lumbering and slow, despite the fact that they played in smaller boxes. No earthworm had ever danced on the ceiling or a hurricane defense in midair. It was the very nature of the LSL's exotic environment that made the fraud so simple to perpetuate. Box arenas were tiny. Even the quartz in Armstrong City with its triple-decked seating fit no more than 700 people, which made ticket costs prohibitive, and shuttle fare up from Earth wasn't exactly the price of lunch either. The majority of fans knew the game only through flat-screen broadcasts and exo-reality, both easily doctored given satellite transmission delays. Maybe the LSL even dubbed extraneous flash static into the ER clips to cover the crucial edits. Maybe Sandifer had been subconsciously aware of the discrepancies, which was why he'd been so desperate to acquire a bootleg video. As for the diehards and fat cats who actually attended in person, Sandifer wasn't shocked that none had noticed the deceit. Games were a social event. Those few who stayed sober were typically the most rabid fanatics, intent on their palm tops, exo-helmets, or at a minimum the cheap infogogs that came with each seat. Serve speeds, career statistics, injury reports, other scores, Vegas odds. So many peripherals bombarded the spectators it was hardly surprising that no one ever realized they were being tricked. Had the corporate backers decided long ago not to leave things to chance? Advertisers needed winners, good-looking winners at that, while the fans wanted heroes and rivalries and the occasional Cinderella story. That would be Sandifer this year. Was his newfound success owed to cheating he wasn't even aware of? Could his destiny be fixed? It was too monstrous to consider, and damned unlikely, he decided. A few techs and league officials might keep their mouths shut, but affecting even a small percentage of the games played would require an entire army of conspirators. Merely trying to keep Bolt on top would be more than enough of a risk. The thieving bastard deserved what was coming to him. My boy, we have to tell. Ramy sat down hard, shaking her head. He'll forfeit and you'll... No, that's no good. Think what they'll do. They might cancel the playoffs altogether. Sandifer knelt beside her, fighting down the urge to pace again and keeping his hand still. Ramy stared as he gently intertwined his fingers with hers. Her skin was cool and calloused. Help me, he said. He kept his voice low. We have an edge here. Bolt doesn't know we know. Ramy started to shake her head again, but Sandifer reached up with his other hand and cupped her jaw. Her lips parted slightly. Involuntarily. Don't ruin this for me, he said. For us. The two of them first met when Ramy blocked Sandifer's path in the tunnels under the Gorbachev Arena. A back box pass pinned to her tight jersey. I can change your life, she declared. Sandifer was smarting from a close loss and pushed past without a word, taking her for a groupie. Your style's all wrong, she said. The power game's never going to work for you, but that fourth point, that was nice. You got out of that dumb set stance and used your natural dexterity. Which was exactly what he'd been thinking. He stopped and looked back. Who the hell are you? So long as we're trading names, she answered, grinning. Calling yourself the Dark Side Destroyer is just stupid. It makes you sound like the supervillain in some kid's story. 
You've got to be more market savvy. If you ever want into the big leagues, you have to play that game too. Sanford dumped his first manager two weeks later, a man who'd been with him for three grueling years, a dedicated but unimaginative ape who'd pitched the same style of brute strength that, according to Ramey, 85% of all players used. Jake Bolt had been too successful, Ramey said, for the modern game to have evolved any differently. Me? I could play that way, she claimed. You? You're a spider. You're never going to overpower anybody. Let's sneak up on them instead. And so the Sandman was born. Gerald Sandifer's background wasn't half as melodramatic as his official LSL bio. And to say that he'd never wanted to be anything except a smasher was an outright lie. Like every other kid, he dreamed of being a belt miner. He had a gift for math and spatial relations that served him well in the box. The LSL didn't believe in complicated personas, of course. The public had a multitude of interlocking alliances and rivalries to keep track of. So most smashers were reduced to a caricature with one memorable trait. Sandifer had been built up as an ambitious madman, a bad guy. Maybe because he was hardly a sexy blonde giant. Maybe because he'd been in the minors for years. But once he mastered his game, suddenly knocked off a number of regional favorites. The news nets had a great time with it. Sandman puts out the lights for the Vector King. And Sandman is a bad dream for Kashabi. It was true that he was an airlock orphan who learned to fight early on for food, for toys, because older kids wanted to work off some anger on him. The media made a lot of that. The traumas he'd supposedly suffered, pointing to his miserly spending habits, and the fact that he wasn't dating a model or an ER star like many successful smashers. They could just as easily have highlighted his need for real intimacy and the fact that he was building a nest egg to share with the right person. But that was just too sappy. And while it was also true that he'd become single-minded in his hunger for a superbox ring, his idea of success was not to garner endorsement deals or ER cameos, or to impress women. He wanted a permanent place on the list of champions, something that he could always point to and say, I was there. He wanted a victory that could never be taken away. Anne Ramey shared his desire for immortality, though her ambition was hot and loud, whereas his lurked deep within like an iceberg, only sometimes peeking up. Sandifer thought her infatuation with him was really just a side effect, that her own career had ended so suddenly when she was still in her prime had clearly made her crazy in some ways. Ramey had been calling him my boy for months before he realized the subtext, an older, childless woman pursuing sexual relations with her student. Maybe he should have leapt into her arms. It would have been easier for them both. Two days zipped by like an opening serve clocked at 185. Every minute that he wasn't exercising or asleep, including mealtimes, Sandifer reviewed exo reel clips of Jake Bolt's games, comparing Bolt's point of view to his opponents, studying hard for glitches. The second night he dreamed that he actually was Bolt, a thick, confused nightmare in which he gave his own decapitated skull punishing wax. Ramey diligently waded through a tall stack of recordings herself, but even after they knew what to look for, it wasn't obvious. Many ER clips had no edits, sometimes because Bolt wasn't looking directly at the ball as he reached and stretched to defend a score zone. So the game continued and either the scoreboard changed or it didn't. And mostly it didn't. Running the opponent's point of view in simulcast was often no help. Smashers wasted little time celebrating a score, and at the crucial moments were almost always busy trying to recover their defensive stance before Bolt returned the shot. In other games, there just wasn't a need to cheat. Bolt was truly a dominant player. Yet at least a third of the clips contained questionable moments. Flash static covering saves that probably weren't saves. Blocks that weren't blocks. Bolt seemed to have an easy time of hitting his opponent's score zones as well. The edge was a small one, rarely worth more than an extra point or two, but that was all the great Jake had needed to rule the field for six years. And whether the man had cheated in one game or in one million was immaterial. They had all the evidence they needed. If Sandifer's plan went bad and they found themselves backed into a corner, 
they had the power to put Bolt in jail along with whichever LSL officials could be held accountable. This isn't going to be easy, Sandifer said. I don't know anything about software. He'd set his smart chair on high massage, but still couldn't get the knots in his shoulders to loosen. He'd even allowed himself a cup of rum. His first in three weeks since his loss in the semifinals to Savage Ryko. But instead of melting his tension, the alcohol only seemed to focus his thoughts into one tight, stubborn block about the size and shape of a smash ball. Raimi shook her head mournfully. Sounds damn impossible to me. They just don't let anybody waltz into the computer rooms, my boy, and whatever Bolt's paying them, you can't top it. Her voice hadn't been loud since their discovery, not even during Sandifer's workouts. Her gaze rarely seemed to lift from the ground now, and when she did look directly at him, her eyes flickered with a new watchfulness, a new hopefulness. Somehow that made Sandifer happy. He was very fond of her. He just wished she'd be more quiet. I don't want to pay them, he said. Raimi peered into the cup of rum that he'd pushed on her. What else can you do? She asked. Talk sweet? You know anyone who owns a gun? Nobody off Earth has guns, you bonehead. Except maybe some hands runners in the ER dramas. Knives, then. Someone who also has a brain. Raimi glanced up with a trace of her old enthusiasm. You gonna tell me exactly what your plan is? The moment before entering the box was always what Sandifer remembered most clearly afterward. During a game, he was all instinct and reflex, but standing in the tunnel, he often felt like a giant, thick-skinned heart, his entire body surging with anticipation inside his rubbery suit. Today, he imagined himself as an explosion captured in a human shape. Sandman! He trotted through the gate, head down, not waving. The gate hit the floor with a resonant bang, becoming part of the wall as he leaped onto his lower platform in one smooth glide. He always tried to time it so that the impact and vibration appeared to be caused by his landing. Jake Bolt was already atop his own upper platform, one hand raised like Caesar to the crowds outside the glass. Without ceremony, Sandifer opened with a slap shot which was bad etiquette, but not against any rule. He wanted to show that he was here to play. He flexed his right hand open quickly, the repeller field snapping into place with a rifle crack, then smashed the ball off the floor in front of Bolt's platforms at an angle. It careened from high on the left wall, off the ceiling, and down at Bolt's lower platform. Bolt dodged under the ball and flicked it sideways, buying himself time leaping back onto his upper platform to intercept his own ricochet. Could he be about to throw a bolt special? So early in the game? He did, but it went wide. Surprised, Sandifer glanced around for the rebound and ducked low to protect himself and got a face full of hard metal ball. Bolt had aimed at the corner and brought a complicated double bounce right into him. The ball crunched against his cheekbone, the thin, flexible suit protecting him not at all. He toppled. In that moment of freefall, he was aware only of his embarrassment. Then he hit the floor, and the breath went out of him, and his body would not get up. Bolt racked up three quick points before Sandifer could push himself onto his feet, and might have scored more except that a bad bounce sent the ball careening laterally through the no-man's land between them. Sandifer had time to crawl back into a ready position before the ball returned to Bolt. Maybe Bolt had wanted it that way. He clubbed another special, straight in, to hit Sandifer again. Sandifer's cheek was bloody raw, but strangely, his splintered cheekbone felt like it had been dipped in liquid hydrogen, flash frozen and torn from the warm muscle. The impact of repelling the ball was fantastic agony, but the sight of it careening dead center off the score zone of Bolt's lower platform, Bolt chasing it futilely, made him feel like a human explosion again. The pain faded, and as the ball clattered from the ceiling to floor to ceiling back toward him, Sandifer leapt from his upper platform to meet it, arcing high like a meteor. He wrenched his shoulder, putting everything he had into the shot. Anticipating its angle, Bolt leapt back towards his own upper platform even as Sandifer swung. 
Sandifer was vaguely aware of the crowd rising to its feet all around them. Bolt guessed badly and the ball bashed off his lower platform, another point for Sandifer. The ball came off the back wall in a steep line, well over Bolt's attempt to collect it, giving Sandifer time to retreat back to his platforms in two springing hops. Then he sent another slap shot off the left wall. This one was all finesse. It careened high into the middle of the ceiling, low off the back wall, then lower still off the right wall. Bolt seemed off balance now, but nearly got under this shot as well, stretching out one hand. The ball glanced off his fingers near the edge of the score zone. It could have gone either way. Sandifer dared a glance at the display board as the ball bounced lazily over the prone champion. 3-3. Three, three. The score had counted, and it wasn't until then that he'd had any way of knowing if Raimi's people successfully forced their way into the control room, making the conspirators shut down the selective programs that gave Bolt his edge. They hadn't dared to make their move until right before game time. In that moment, something like love yammered through Sandifer's chest, pure and fiery. He was playing an honest game, which is all he'd ever wanted. Bolt grabbed the ball, poor etiquette again, but not against the rules since the next serve was his. He also glanced at the scoreboard. Cheating bastard was clearly shaken and trying to slow the pace of the game. Sandifer never gave him a chance. He kept working the left wall and the ceiling, throwing in change-ups off the back corners, deliberately aiming for the borders of Bolt's score zones. By then, Bolt must have known what had happened. He should have been ready for it, but the champ had gotten sloppy after having some of his work done for him for so long. Sandifer took two points that might have been erased if Bolt's programs were still working, and losing that advantage also seemed to cost Bolt a psychological edge. Sandifer gained another point toward the end when the champ gave up on chasing a multiple ricochet. Bolt tried repeatedly to overpower him and caught him again in the ribs, a glancing blow, but Sandifer never returned the favor. He didn't want to hurt Bolt. He wanted the title. They called it the blackout because Raimi's people turned off more control programs than necessary and knocked out the Exo Real broadcasts of what many later said was the greatest upset of all time. The final score was 9-4, and even before the final seconds ticked off, Sandifer could imagine the bulletin screaming, Sandman to Bolt, good night! Above and around him, people crowded against the glass, cheering and booing so loudly he actually heard a low grumble through the soundproofing. For once, he waved back. Bolt had already turned to leave and Sandifer jogged across the box, feeling no pain until he forced his jaw to move. Jake, wait. Tomorrow he'd be swollen like a tube squash, and the super box was just a week away, yet win or lose it, he would always have this moment. Bolt paused at his gate, pushing the gogs up onto his forehead. His dark eyes were hard and angry. Listen to me, Sandifer whispered. You tell them to stop. If I ever see any cheating again, I'll go public. I will. This isn't the place to talk about. He interrupted with a bloody grin. If you think you can rope me in, forget it. A win that's handed to you isn't any kind of win. You got lucky once. I kicked your ass fair and square. But you'll never get at the software again. And you'll just ruin the sport if you make any noise about it. Bolt's mouth curled into a smile, though his eyes stayed as emotionless as dirt. We can make things sweet for you. Not interested. Do it my way. Try anything stupid and it's all ready to go. Nat, vid, er. You'll be shit forever. Bolt turned away. Across the box, Sandifer's gate snapped up with a resounding clang, and Raimi bounded out, whooping. You did it! You did it, my boy! She was so happy, she was pretty. Bolt slapped the controls of his gate and dodged through. Sandifer almost went after him, thinking he'd better force a promise. But there would be time for that later. Raymond deserved his attention first. He laughed as she smothered him in an embrace. And when she kissed him wetly, he kissed back. The Sandman wanted always to be honest about his debts. Author's Note. Hi, my name is Jeff Carlson. I'm here today to talk a little bit about my short story, Enter Sandman, for Doonstief. 
Um, I'm an athlete. I like to run around on the beach and throw footballs and frisbees. I ski, uh, just all kinds of stuff. This story is set, you know, in a not too distant future on the moon and mostly revolves around the Lunar Smash Ball League, the LSL. Uh, this came from my friends and I, we used to live on the central coast of California. One of the favorite things that we like to do is go down to the beach with, uh, we called it whack ball. I guess it's called paddle ball officially. You know, you have like these, these wooden kind of rackets and like a racket ball kind of a ball. And if you're really doing it, I mean, you could be standing 50, 60 feet apart and just be just whacking that ball. That's what we call it, whack ball. You could be playing it in the surf, running around. You know, if you could be playing with a group of people, at least three or four is best because then the balls can be, you know, zinging left and zinging right. And you got to dive in the sand and roll in the water. And it was just really cool. Uh, back in 2002 or 2001, Artemis Magazine debuted uh, and had, a, had a, a short but good run. They were sponsored by a group whose name escapes me, but they were into developing the moon. You know, they wanted, they, they still do, they want hotels and tourists and all this great stuff on the moon, which I think is kind of a cool idea. Um, and as a beginning science fiction writer, I was looking to target markets and give them what they wanted so I could get into print. And Artemis Magazine was looking for stories about, you know, near future stories set on the moon and how things would be there. And, and so I wrote a story about whack ball in low gravity and developed this whole league. And you could do all these cool things in the microgravity, you know, uh, you could do the hurricane maneuver and you could bounce off the ceiling and all this great stuff. And that's where the idea came from. Of course, I developed some backstory for my, my heroes and my anti-heroes. And brought that all together. It was a fun piece. It was actually the first professional sale of my career. So it holds uh, it holds a place that is near and dear in my heart. I hope you guys enjoy it. And shoot me an email. I am at jverse.com. That's J as in, J as in Jeff. Verse is in universe. Uh, we've got some other free fiction there. Excerpts of my novels. Uh, a mind-croggling book trailer for my, my Plague Year and Plague War series here. Just come on by and say howdy. I'll talk to you later. All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story. Yes, thank you for the submission, Jeff. And thank you for listening, uh, Mr. John Smith of 223 Crescent Circle. Yes, it's nice to have one listener. We do appreciate our listener and his... Oh, you know, we actually had a, a second listener last week. We did. I, I looked on our stats, yeah. Turns out it was your mom, but... Oh, well, you know, can I ask you... Why would you, why do you look at the stats? It's just, it's masochism is what it is. Well, I, I'm just that kind of a person, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I sent her an email and asked about it. Yeah, she said she's not going to be listening again. She oh. wasn't pleased. So. And how's your mom doing? Uh, my mom's dead. Still. All right. Uh, well, I was hoping for a change. Sorry about that. We hope that uh, if you are an aspiring writer or a real writer or a perspiring writer, that you will send us a submission, some kind of entertaining piece. And how would they get that to us? The address to send submissions to is submissions at doonsteef.com. It's as easy as that. I think uh, even my six-year-old child could manage to submit us a story if he would only take the time to write it. But he'd have to know how to spell Doonsteef. Dune Steve is spelled D U N E S T E E F. You know, I've, I've been wondering a long time the word Dune Steve, where, where does that come from? What does that mean? Oh, well, it was a, it's, a, it's a good story, actually. <laughs> it better be. Several uh, years back, I, I mentioned my six year old child. Several years back, we were trying to have children for the first time, me and my wife. You know, it, it just wasn't working out, and we had various friends who, you know, they all had kids, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, try first thing in the morning, or uh, upside down, or, you know, what, you know, all sorts of crazy things. We tried them all. It didn't work. So it's late at night, and we're sleeping, and then the phone rings in the middle of the night. That I, I thought it was going to be really bad news. I pick up the phone, and it's just heavy breathing. <sighs> and I'm like, who is this? And you looked at the caller ID, and it was me. 
<laughs> no, this was before we had any caller ID, so I couldn't identify. He's just breathing, and I was freaking out. And then the guy in the line just goes, Dune, Steve. And then he hung up. Creepy, dude. Yeah, I was totally creeped out. So anyways, the, the next day, my wife takes a pregnancy test, and it's finally worked. She's pregnant. We managed to have a baby. The day after somebody calls and says, Dune, Steve. And so, you know, Dune, Steve is like our lucky word now. I don't know what it means. I don't care. It's the name of the, the magazine now. Yeah, I almost named the child Dune, Steve, even, because I love the word so much. <laughs> we just <laughs> saying her heads prevailed, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. We named the child Gunther instead. So, uh, you know, strange name for a girl, but, you know, we liked it. But uh, you said that you had been trying to have a child for some time. I mean, uh-huh. you had been, right. you and your We're wife had been doing that thing. Doing, doing that thing <laughs> I've read so much about. I mean, mm-hmm. more than just that night. Yeah, right. I mean, for like weeks. Or, oh, yeah, of course. But if you got her pregnant, the pregnancy test wouldn't come out positive the next day, would it? No. I was just trying to clarify the. So, w- what did the word really have to do with any of. Uh, I don't know, I guess. It... <laughs> Son of a bitch. Anyways, yeah, we also really appreciate donations. We would. Yeah, we'd like to appreciate some donations. Anyways, we pay our authors with the money that is donated to our podcast. And so, we, we, well, we would like to be able to rely on donations to take care of these authors. Uh, my children would especially like that. They used to come to me and they would say, Daddy... Why is there no more food? The cupboards are bare. But they used to. They don't anymore. No, they just kind of lie there now. They can't muster the strength to say anything anymore. It's really sad. Do you think that was too much of a guilt trip? Well, I, I feel kind of bad. I mean, I, I think okay. I have three or four dollars. Okay, d- please donate. Our authors please want that money. Please give. Please, sir. Can I have some more? More, you little tw- All right. Uh-huh. Hey, can you edit that out, please, robot? Robot. Dude, I, it's it's not even looking at me now. I, last week, I complained about it looking at me. Now it's looking. What is so much more interesting about that wall? Uh, oh, wait, OT. Sorry, man. So today's story... Enter Sandman. Enter Sandman. Hush, little Sandman. baby, don't say a word. <laughs> we'll ask him to edit all that out. Okay. You know, the one time I, I listened to the podcast, A, so I guess we've got two listeners. And oh, yeah. I was singing on there, and it was, it was still there. <laughs> I told him. I don't know why he didn't do it. So he doesn't obey you either. I mean, why, why do we have him around? Keep our email working? I think that's why I got him around in the first place. But yeah, today's story, uh, Enter Sandman. Us Very- little bit. <laughs> You know, I don't know how many times we can keep editing that out. Okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, Inner Sandman by Jeff Carlson. is. Uh, it was a fun story. I was ready to accept the story before I even read it just because it was titled Inner Sandman, and I'm a long-standing, enormous Metallica fan. I'll yeah, absolutely I, I never, love it. I never knew anybody as big a Metallica fan <laughs> as you. And, uh, Back on the subject, um, the story is about a new sport Jeff Carlson invented just for this story. And it got me thinking about invented sports that people uh, include in fiction, like Quidditch, for example, or films that they do that a lot with. Um, like Rollerball. Or right, Rollerball. Death Race 2000. Death Race 2000, the running good man, one. Kind of well, yeah, The Running Man, that's good. It just makes me think about that. And, you know, I really like the story, which I th- thought was kind of odd because I generally don't like stories about invented sports for some reason because you're a big sports fan of of the real sports right that might be the case i'm not sure do invented sports tend to turn you off or do you enjoy them as much as anything else i like when somebody has created a sport and they've made up all these rules that they try to make some kind of sense of how you could actually play this game Uh Uh, for example battle royale battle royale (laughs) i don't know how you say it in english but uh in that, it's this, uh, I guess it's supposed to be futuristic world, uh, yeah, probably, you know, 1996 or something <laughs> like that, where kids have become so out of control that uh, to make an example for all the rest of the Japan's kids, they uh, select a high school class, and they send them all off into this island. There's like 30 of them. 
and the object of the game is to kill all the other students, mm-hmm. and then when there's one left, he's the winner. He or she is the winner. And they came up with like these silly rules of you know there being places that you couldn't go at certain points, and everybody gets a bag, and you don't know what's going to be in the bag. It could be something really useful, like a first aid kit, or it could be a walkie-talkie, or it could be a, a pistol, mm-hmm. or it could be a roll of toilet paper. And it's just one of those things. It's totally random. And toilet they, paper would be very important. They came up with some really interesting rules to this made up i mean i I don't know if that's what you're referring to because it's not really a sport but it's like a a game Uh there's probably a better example of one where you watch it and you go wow they've really thought this out we could actually play i i really liked what jeff carlson did with his made-up sport where he kept the rules really vague it seemed there wasn't a lot of rules i guess that's a line in the story there aren't any rules and the crazy thing is it's about a guy who cheats but yeah, I, I've always thought that the rules of Quidditch were just a real failing in the Harry Potter series. While I still enjoy it, just because I, I like soccer and Quidditch is supposed to be similar in ways to soccer. They all, you know, dress in their colors and they have crazy fans in the stands and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, I, I've always really loved the pageantry and craziness of soccer in, in Europe. Now, hey, are, in Europe, are they called soccer hooligans? Because oh. that's what we call them. Or do they call them football they hooligans? They would be foot, football hooligans. You I never think, hear yeah. somebody say football hooligans. Yeah, that's... It's always soccer hooligans. That's, uh, they may just call them plain old hooligans because they all know hooligans always are soccer hooligans or something. I don't know. But uh, anyways... Yes, I, I'm sorry. I swerved <laughs> us right off the road there. But yeah, we I, scraped up the side of the car and you hit that part that goes... Yeah, I hate that part, man. Holy cow. Anyways, they just seem so, the rules are stacked so much to make Harry Potter Mr. Super Duper important. And the rest of the team, I don't even know why they're even out there. Harry Potter scores 150 points by catching the silver snitch and the golden, game. Golden snitch. Oh, sorry, you're right. <laughs> that just proves me not a very good Harry Potter guy, I guess. How dare you? <laughs> She doesn't say darkly too much in those books. But, uh, yeah, he catches the snitch, and the game ends also, and he scores 150 points to where basically you catch the snitch and you win the game every time. Every goal that the rest of the team scores is worth 10 points, and he gets 150. So they have to score 15 goals to match up to one snitch. It's just so ridiculously weighted towards making Harry Potter the important part. I I still like that sport. Boy, it shows up great in the movies sometimes, you know. It just looks so interesting and fun. Whereas most other sports that show up in the movie that are invented, like your rollerball, what's his name, the rapper... Is it LL Cool J that's on that? or who, Isn't there a rapper in that I don't know, show? I, I've only seen the James Conn version. Of uh, I've only seen snippets of it, but they're like freaking riding around in a circle on motorcycles and jumping through hoops of fire. And dude, what the heck kind of sport is that? And what freaked out alternate universe is ever going to develop a sport like that? I don't know. One of those things that tends to come up again and again and again, whether it's a futuristic sport or just a contemporary sport that doesn't exist or is the violence of these sports that, that, you know, you can kill your opponents. Yeah, that's that's always the deal. We're going to get less and less civilized as we become more and more. It's always this future sports, too. It's like here we are in the year 2150 and the motorcycle race death match. I, I. I remember, you know, I don't know if even people will remember the show Max Headroom from the 80s. (laughs) But they had an episode in which they had one of those goofy sports where people were in like a pit and they rode on motorized skateboards, I think. And they killed people and and they were like underground games, you know. And who would even participate participate in a sport like this? It's like Roman gladiators or something. You got to bring in some freaking prisoner of war from one of your conquests and say, okay, get in the motorcycle death match game. <laughs> it always seems crazy when they do that. You can kill your opponent because our society is definitely going in the opposite direction. If, if you had a young child that was participating in children's sports you these days you know you put your kid in the peewee baseball league or you put them in the soccer league or you put them in the motorcycle deathmatch league 
Um, the tricycle death match. <laughs> if you put them in any, they've watered down these sports so unbelievably. Well, you can't keep score because some of these kids might feel bad if they didn't win the game. So it doesn't matter if the game's eight to nothing or eight to eight or whatever. Nobody's supposed to know what the score is, and I guess they figure kids can't count. But and there's other stuff like pee wee baseball. You know, you get up there and you get four strikes or five strikes or something instead of three. And if you don't get a hit, okay, now the kid can pick up the ball and throw it into the field and run the bases as though he got a hit, just so that he gets to feel like. He did something special. I don't know. Wouldn't it help the kid more to practice until he could actually <laughs> hit the ball? I... You would think. A lot of people say that sports are sort of a, a metaphor for life, and they teach you things that are important in life, like teamwork and certain things, that, you know, someday when you... Catching a line, driving the cup. Right. <laughs> someday when you grow up and actually get a real job you you know you'll be able to use these things that you've learned and, you know i can understand you know learning to stick with it to the point where you can hit a baseball or whatever it is that you're trying to do something that people need to learn today's kids they don't these kids today they don't learn to stick with it they learn to get everything handed to them, and eventually they're yeah. God, I'm got, I'm gone so off the deep end. I sound like Rush Limbaugh or something here, don't I? <laughs> Five more pounds, <laughs> two more cheeseburgers, and you'll be there. All right, let's go hit the McDonald's, and we'll finish this when we get back. Not to change the subject, and I'm not really, but every year you'll get another sports movie with mm -hmm. the underdog and the down and out uh -huh. team from the wrong side of the tracks or the yeah. wrong color or you the wrong, a, you know. Another version of uh, the Bad News Bears. Oh, well, see, I was thinking of it's always Hoosiers. And oh, so Ho okay. Hoosiers you're, only with field hockey and Hoosiers only with Mahjong. You're thinking the and, more realistic one, not the uh, the Mighty Ducks. You know, I never saw any of the Mighty Ducks movies. Mm. I never saw the Mighty Ducks quadrology, and I never saw the Free Willy saga. Mm. Isn't that weird? I, I think they both came out around the same time. Was I just the wrong age? Probably. They Do you think that kids. that's why my life is so screwed up? Is I never saw Mighty Ducks or a Free Willy? Yeah. Okay. Well, now I feel a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, Disney does one every year or, or even more often. I mean, shoot, they did one with the, the freaking debate team. They did the great one. debaters. Yes. Yeah, and it, it has Denzel in it. I can think he was in Remember the Titans. Was he yeah. in any of the He's others? He's the inspirational coach in a lot, yeah. Dude, I, like I got to admit, that movie kind of looked good to me. Yeah. Maybe we should get that. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm, I've always been the opposite of you. You know, you had women hanging off of you, and I had Clothes you know, mucus hanging, hang, hanging off of me. You were all the big sports hero, and you know, the guy with the letter jacket and the erection, and I was the guy who stood in the corner. And well, it's, I'm still that guy. But I, for some reason, really like sports movies, and I, I can't help but get all into it. And maybe it's because I'm living vicariously through the characters. You know, I never got to hit the field and do any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, make the winning touchdown and nail the hell out of the cheerleader and any of that stuff. I don't remember the last sports movie I saw where they included that scene. I think it was Varsity Blues with the famous line. I don't want your life. Gosh, that was so much fun. Uh, James <laughs> Vanderbeek, rest in peace. Is he dead? Or dead? Oh, because I'm he's... sorry. No, his career. Yeah, I I love those shows too. There's just something about you get to the end and they win that big game and you always tear up a little bit. Of course, I, I don't know what it is about me. I cry way too often at movies. James Vanderbeek nails the cheerleader and I'm crying. I'm just like, this is it. I can't believe he finally nailed her so hard. Why can't I be the cheerleader? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> um, that's a little different I mean, than what Pacey. I was thinking. But that's uh, what I wanted to be. Anyways, um, yeah. I wanted to be best friend of, of James so, Vanderbeek. Uh, so that was our podcast today. Thanks for listening. Um, it's been a good time. I can't even comment on that. In what universe has it been a good time? <laughs> there was a story that was worth listening to. Uh, yes. So thank you for listening to that. Thank you for submitting. Please submit. Please donate. Please keep listening. Please keep them cards and letters coming. <laughs> So this has been Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield informing you that I don't want your life. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files.